Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Bob Dempsey from the Department of Neurological Surgery at Wisconsin, and we're giving our update on the COVID-19 situation, which is predominantly dominated by the issues of Delta, boosters, and mandates. I think we should talk about that. I'd like to share my screen a bit to see if we can't illustrate these points. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is where we are in the world, where we are in the nation. And again, being in good shape in Dane County is not the same as being in good shape worldwide. We're responsible worldwide. We're physicians, nurses, doctors, medical professionals of many types. We take care of the whole world, and that's important. So the first thing is to understand that this has been a historic pandemic. I mean, the fact that it shut the world down for one and a half years, and with probably another six months to go, should tell you something. But the numbers are staggering. A third of a billion people have had this that we know about. And of course, we are not very good at knowing about how many cases took place in areas of Africa, even South America, even the United States for that matter. Whatever figure you have, you have to multiply. But we're pretty clear that we've had almost 5 million deaths. That's staggering uh, compared to thousands of deaths for some infections, hundreds for some others that are more famous. The 1918 pandemic was more. We're not sure how much more, but it was probably an order of 10 more. Other things such as plague spread out over hundreds of years affected populations more. But this is sort of unprecedented in our, quote, modern time. And it's important to understand that we've given out 6 million, I'm sorry, billion, B, billion, doses of vaccine worldwide. There are only 7.8 billion people in the world. So that means that about a third of the world has been vaccinated. And then there's a number of people that are probably caught in between. They've got one dose, they hope to get another. But that means that two thirds of the world is available to grow mutations for this very, very infectious virus. So that gives you some sort of a spectrum of the disease and the response we've tried to make to it worldwide. We have a lot of work to go because it will not be over until we can end it in Africa in Asia, in South America, in Central America as well, because we know its variations, mutants grown there can infect us. I'll say a lot more about that in a bit. The state of the world we talked about, the U.S. state is very important because while Wisconsin mirrors it, it's a little bit different in that this is definitely a hotspot disease. You'll see waves sweeping through a country or a state, or a region, or a city, and it spares an equally unvaccinated or vaccinated city of the same size for education. And that other city, as we were early last year, at, um, you know, say May of last year, we had very few cases, and we thought it was because we were masking more than other people. Well, when the fall and winter came last year, Wisconsin was devastated. And so there is a, a hot spot aspect to it. And the hope is that it runs out of hot spots and dies out. And that we've learned that this past three months have been primarily in the US South and West. And we did correlate that to a slight degree to degrees of vaccination or masking in those areas. There is truth to that, but there is also truth that vaccinated masked but not completely vaccinated areas can be devastated by this recent variation. I think if you look at the numbers in Wisconsin, and these are seven-day averages of numbers per day. So if you smooth out a week, you get these numbers. In the top, you can see just the cases. And the thing that to compare is where we are now and where we were last October. About the same. The difference was last October, we were on a roller coaster ride up a very steep slope to disaster in Wisconsin. We couldn't handle that and we did not yet have vaccinations. 
things are different now. There's this herky jerky rise, which has been taking place for the since um, early uh, um, September, where we would see more and more and more cases. Uh, but it does have a slight tendency to level off. Some people are trying to think there's a peak going on already in our state. There might be true. It seems to be happening throughout the country. That's important and that's hopeful and I am hopeful. The no reason I'm hopeful is because we cannot tolerate the hospitalizations or ICU beds. If you look where we became devastated last year and really things broke down, we couldn't take care of cancer care properly. We couldn't take care of the regular patients. We're very close to that. We're very close to those numbers, but not quite to it yet. Where we had 2,200, and that wasn't very much per day in hospitalized in the state, we have 1,000 now. Where we had 456 ICU patients, with COVID last winter, we have 335 now. We cannot tolerate much more. We need that curve to flatten. It's interesting to see that the deaths are not as high. They're still rising, 11, 12, 13 per day in the state, but these are far less than they were during the winter. And the differences are several. One is on the bottom. As this rise took place, the reluctant people began to become vaccinated. That's been very important. That's probably the most important reason that this has decreased. The second thing is, what are the cases made of? We know the hospitalizations and deaths are primarily middle age and elderly. The death rate in elderly is still quite high. The reason we don't have as many deaths is we've vaccinated so many elderly. And because elderly's vaccinations tend to wear off, this is really the impetus behind boosters. We cannot allow them to be unprotected, our nursing homes, et cetera, or we'll be back with very high death rates. But the cases, about a third of them are children. And that's, that's important. They are getting cases, but they're not getting sick or hospitalized or dying in large numbers really less than 1%, far less than 1% of the children who get sick or even hospitalized. But they are a reservoir for cases. And so that's been our biggest concern for this past month with the schools is, can they be vaccinated? Now, I made the crazy guess a few months ago that we would be vaccinating children by October. I think I will be, turn out to be right. The studies suggest dosing and safety of at least one of the major U.S. vaccinations for children of school age, and I predict it'll be it'll be passed in October and will be vaccinating children. This is the main reason why I have great hopes that by New Year, for several reasons, changes in the mutant, changes in the vaccination, the pool of people that could carry it and then infect somebody older who could, get, who could get hospitalized, that's going to be less available to this virus, and we're going to see it decrease. So what does that really mean when we think about uh, the state of Wisconsin? Well, right now our, in our own shop, we have about on average 35 COVID patients in the hospital. Meritor about 25, St. Mary's about 30, Swedes about 25. This is something we can barely manage. We cannot tolerate many more. Now, the one of the reasons to have hope is that the children, although they may be carrying it, are not getting very sick. And the big potential carrier, the campus, which opened up in September, is being tightly, tightly regulated and tightly monitored. And we saw the peak of the cases on campus pass. That was September 16th. We now have 95% of the campus vaccinated. And that's without a mandate, but with very strict criteria for testing if you are not vaccinated and masks for all indoor activities. 
So this really changed everything. It meant that we can show a population where we can cause the peak to happen earlier and softer and go down. Hospital, hospitalizations and deaths are still the older, and by that I mean middle age and older, with the rate much higher in the elderly. The vaccination rates are wonderful on campus. They're 95%. They're not throughout the United States. We are in Dane County 76% vaccinated. That is probably one of the highest counties in the country. The state, however, is only 56% vaccinated and other states are 30 some percent vaccinated. So this reluctant people getting vaccinated is going to be the key to us getting past this because we've shown when the population is widely vaccinated, the virus cannot get a foothold. It's important to know that because we see that there are small percentages that can't be vaccinated, very small, less than 1%, small percentages that uh, claim a religious exemption, about 3%, but we got down to only 1% people that are reluctant and may possibly still change their mind on campus. What are we up against? Well, this variation called Delta. It's important to understand what uh, mutants and variations in viruses are. They happen in every virus. It's part of being a virus. And it is very important to know that most of these mutations harm the virus. That's why they don't ever get too carried away. That's why they get controlled. That's why even the worst of these tend to calm down. So in other words, a virus, a coronavirus, common cold virus is going along, it mutates, all the time, and maybe every 80, 100 years, it gets a mutation that is really quite virulent and you get an outbreak of some sort. Now, this is particularly what the coronavirus is. But the very odd thing is, most of the ongoing variations then or mutations weaken the viruses and other flus and et cetera have died out only to find a different flu, a different variation, a different uh, strain altogether comes up in the future years. The Delta variant is very odd for a virus that got lucky enough to be virulent in 19 to in 20 have another mutation which made it so much more uh, susceptible or so much more infectious is really quite odd. This virus won the lottery and the world lost. However, it, back, it, it is changing as well. And the hope is that it will be replaced by another variation, which doesn't make you very sick, but replaces it. There isn't a particular advantage for the virus to destroy its host. But it tells you also that this variant has been able to change enough to outwit some of the vaccines that we see in the rest of the world. And so we must vaccinate, but we must be thoughtful about how we do that. And that really brings us to this whole question of what is the state of vaccinations now? And to understand that, you have to understand there are many ways, and I've given other lectures about the way they make vaccines, but there are three which are approved in the United States. Two are the, the new RNA, uh, one is a more traditional. And the three available, the Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, &J, are all effective. Now, we learned a lot about them as we began to look at the Delta variant and the question of boosters. We know that depending on your age, you tend to decrease the amount of Our antibodies that you make over months. This is why we're been particularly concerned about giving more dosing to elderly or susceptible or immunocompromised people. That's what proves to be effective. A very fascinating thing took place when we began to look at the J&J &J, uh, vaccine. They, of course, sold it as a one-dose vaccine, thinking it would be cheaper and more available worldwide it made sense. 
But now they've discovered that it's less effective than the other two in the United States and it seemed to almost disappear. So they made the logical decision, what would happen if we gave two doses, just like the other ones did? It turns out in a small study, it's as effective as the other two are when they give two doses. They just made a rather you know, unfortunate choice to market it as a one-dose vaccine. So I predict you'll be seeing J&J &J boosters soon. Right now, there are studies going on every vaccine in the world to see if more doses are useful. In other parts of the world, they're just giving them. In this country, we test, we look at safety, look at efficacy, and then we roll it out. It has been approved for the Pfizer. It has been approved and the indications are becoming wider and wider. That would be the third dose. And the reason is, is that we see in elderly that their antibody levels fall. Therefore, we predict that their ability to resist the Delta variant would be decreased. And we predict, we know that when we give a third dose, their antibodies rise again. And we predict that will give much more protection. These are predictions, not proven yet, but they are good predictions. And they're likely to be true. I predict that you will see this in every vaccine. So right now, the Pfizer is being given for older people, for people that do healthcare, direct patient contact, for people that are immunocompromised. I suspect it will be broadened as we learn more. But usually we're looking for people like six months after their last shot, their second shot. And that makes sense. That's available like yesterday, and we're already backed up for weeks and months to get that booster shot. So it suggests, just as the numbers for the world, is that people take this seriously and are interested in getting the shots. And I do recommend it. The biggest concern I have is the ethics of getting three shots when people in the world have yet to have their first. Now, that requires us to work the lobby, to work nationally and internationally to make sure the world gets their shots. It doesn't mean you shouldn't get yours uh, when it's available, but it means that hand in hand with that, we work to care for everyone. Um, what about children? There is a study which suggests that they have figured out a safe dose for children. It has shown us why children have done so well. They robustly build antibodies to this and to this back to this virus and throw it off. And at a third the dose of an adult, it seems to be the dose for children. And I predict you'll see that rolled out in October. And I think it's very important because if you take away that reservoir for this virus, the children, our vaccination rates soar up to to levels where the virus may not be able to find enough available hosts and it will die out. And that could start to happen as soon as January 1st, if we're very lucky as far as the decreases in the virus. That's my hope. And that's what I really think we can do. So what are the rules and what are the regulations? There's a lot of it. Right now, the world is quite worried about this and properly so. And different nations have different rules. Some want travelers desperately. Uh, and they reason that if you are vaccinated and test negative, you can come, come in and work. In general, as far as UW rules, we don't want any international travel. And international travel, I would recommend, would be only for family urgencies. Uh, Vaccination and mask mandates, well, it's very, very successful, uh, but how do we do it? There are nations, there are states, there are counties, there are businesses, they all work by different rules. And it's important to understand where that comes from. UW, UW Med School, UW Campus is part of the state, has direct responsibility to the state and the legislature or indirect. And it therefore is, finds it unable to mandate vaccinations. But they have said you're either vaccinated or you're tested weekly and everybody wears a mask. They're quite within their rights for that. And it's been successful in encouraging people to get vaccinated. 
UW Health has more separation and therefore like a business is able to make their own appropriate rules for health. UW Health has mandated if you want to work here, you have to be vaccinated or have an appropriate accepted excuse. Their hope is of course to get the numbers again above 90 and keep them there and make it a safe place to work. Uh, but it's important, there are dates coming up, October 1st, October 15th, November 1st, November 15th, where if you're not vaccinated or being started in the vaccination sequence, you'll be suspended and in the later dates terminated. And they have a right to do that. Um, and that's been uh, rolled out really in many different private industries, airlines, restaurants, etc. And they are supported and they make sense because without them, they can't do their business. There's no way that they're going to do well without vaccinations or masks because eventually their business will be shut down if this variant has an ability to get to them. So that's really why there's a difference between UW and UW Health in this. Uh, but the goal is, of course, by one way or the other, to increase vaccination in the two key areas, that is the reluctant people and the children. So what's the hope for the future? It's very, very, very hopeful, but we have to do play by the rules. To live with COVID, we have to mask. Now we are using face shields again for things which may cause droplets or really close oral care, respiratory care. But the masks are the more effective because basically the aerosols can go around a face shield, but not a mask. And that's why. And the masks are N95 surgical masks, then multiple ply cloth masks, and then face shields. Uh, bandanas, they're, they're not very useful at all. Distancing is still very important. And so a lot of meetings are done virtual like this one, but we'll be able to go to the real world where we do have to get together, we do have to talk, we could do it safely. The effect of vaccinating children in the US, I think will greatly decrease case numbers because the sick adult was not infected by the relatively asymptomatic child. And that gives the virus less places to hide. I'm hoping to see those numbers fall by January 1st if vaccinations take place. Now remember, vaccinations are multiple. Fort McCoy has the people from Afghanistan and they now have measles in Fort McCoy. So vaccinations are for everything. Children's vaccinations for measles, mumps, rubella are life-saving. And we should not let a fear of a COVID vaccination cause us to not vaccinate our children from these diseases which, which really maim and kill children. Second, the flu. Flu may really rise again, I don't know, but we're concerned that it will, and it will soon. And if at all possible, we're combining vaccines for flu and COVID because that appears to be safe. As far as booster shots, if you had a different brand, should you get the Pfizer? Right now, they're not allowing that. There are other countries that have done that. It seemed not to cause great problems, but the companies have no idea if it's safe to mix them. They prefer not. I actually recommend you wait and see because I'll bet the vaccine that you had in the United States will be available for a booster soon, all three of them. I'm hopeful for careful reopening. Hold on to your vaccination cards. I'll bet you'll be needing them to go to concerts or some restaurants or Lord knows what in the future, because that will be the real ticket to reopening the world. And I think we're going to get there if we can just keep the numbers down by being careful for even a few more months. That's where I think we are. I hope it's hopeful. It is confusing, but it's based on these principles of a variation of effective vaccine that does need to be boosted because its efficacy wanes and it wanes more in older people or sickly people than it does in young people. And we still have to obey the rules, masks, and et cetera, until we get the case numbers down 
where it won't be near you. Because right now it is. You're probably being exposed to the Delta variant if you're out in the world. And so you want the exposure to be as minimal as possible. Your mask and distance does that. And then if it does get through, you want your auto, auto your antibodies to wipe it out. And that's vaccination. That's why that works. So with that, I wish you all the best. Thanks so much for what you're doing. Please remember our nurses. We cannot have another major a surge in the hospital. If we do, we'll get them through it, but I'd much more wish we could avoid it. Thank you very much.